My friends, I was going to do a review of the latest game in this series, Yukimura Den, but since Capcom have announced they're going to celebrate 15 years of this series by re-releasing this game, which came out some five years ago, it's almost like their latest efforts with the series are a joke. Anyway, people would probably prefer that I talk about something I like. Well, I certainly would, instead of slipping into an awful game-induced coma. Anyway, this is the very pinnacle of the series, with an impressive 40 playable characters providing a very unique way of playing the game. Some characters have more in-depth mechanics with such things as frame-perfect timing to get buffs like Nagamasa Azai, or there are more casual friendly characters like Magoichi Sayaka, not to be confused with the one in Samurai Warriors, because that's just the name. Anyway, the basic premise of the game is set very loosely on the Son Goku Jidai era of Japan, with the cast based on famous faces from that time, as well as famous battles from the era being the basis for some of the stages, like Kawanakajima and Sekigahara. I say it's very loose because nearly all of it is made up. The stages aren't really battles, it's just you and your tag team partner versus everyone, and by that I mean a constant wave of enemies and various bosses which are you know, 99% of the time playable characters. And because it's waves of fodder, basically, the enemies aren't total dumbasses, which we'll get onto later. Speaking of the characters, their designs and personalities are radically over the top, which is the same with the gameplay really, and it is one of the most enjoyable features about this game and series in general. Well, at least when the games start becoming good. Nagamasa Azai, for example, looks like a Power Ranger and does over-the-top hero actions and poses. Kasuga screams Kenshin's name to the point of orgasm at the end of every stage, which makes playing as her pretty awkward. <laughs> Probably less embarrassing playing the mini-games in a Senran Kagura game and Tadagatsu Honda in this game and series is turned into a Gundam basically. So yeah, they're a bit over the top shall we say. So stories in this game are done on an individual basis, which stages are randomised to a certain extent in every situation, until you reach five or so stages in where you can continue the random stage thing, or you can pick a stage indicated with a blue scroll, or in some cases a red scroll, to play a character's drama or anime routes, which have fixed stages and usually have a bunch of unique cutscenes in them. The anime routes, which are only available for a select few characters, obviously feature a full episode of a TV series at the end of them, that series being K-On! Anyway, they have anime scenes which are separate from the uh, anime series and movies going by the same name of uh, Son Goku Basura, obviously. Now, stages are also done on an individual basis too, with some, for example, this stage here always has Ieyasu as a boss, so you could call it their stage, as it were, while some others have multiple bosses. Most, if not all, have some sort of gimmick as well. In Ieyasu's stage, you can destroy these supply crates, if all four are destroyed, then Tadagatsu is weakened considerably. But if you let the supply crates reach the main area, he is super powered. Another stage is Kanbei's, where you can ride a minecart and actually has some first person shooting. So there is some variety. Um, some other examples will be playing throughout this video. Thankfully, because of the way the story is done with the randomization, you can ignore stages you don't like, which is quite nice. The stages, like I said earlier, start out most of the time with just you and your tag partner versus mass enemy fodder. You can have your own allied soldiers by capturing the camps scattered across the majority of the stages. Now, soldiers in this game aren't totally stupid, and because they make up most of the game's enemies, they are somewhat of a threat. They come in various shapes and sizes, riflemen, cannoneers, sappers, ninjas, bombardiers. Not only this, but they can create what the game calls formations, where several troops will gather together, like these riflemen who will stand on each other's shoulders and fire simultaneously. And whenever they do this, they have a combined health bar, so if you attack them, you defeat them all in one go. Another is this stupid giant wheel thing, which is nothing but an absolute nuisance. So it is quite nice they've tried to have enemy troops as somewhat of a threat and actually 
do stuff instead of just standing there like your typical, you know, enemy in Warriors are actually four or something. You know what I mean? Now the basic gameplay is fantastic and light years ahead of any of the Warriors games. Mind you, having basic stuff like dodges and parries puts you in a different stratosphere than them. So aside from those features and mechanics, each character has 11 skills, as the game calls them. They're basically just attack strings, which I'll show on screen because it's a bit difficult to explain. What sets these attacks apart for each character is the input for them. Depending on the character, you might need to hold the button down, mash the button, mash a different button, or have perfect timing. For example, Maguichi can turn her pistols into a shotgun, by pressing triangle, but if you mash square, she'll do a combo swinging back and forth. Well, a character like Nagamasa powers himself up by pressing R1. If you press it again while his hands light up both times he does his stupid little pose, he'll power up fully. It'll be a hell of a lot stronger, which is, you know, quite a nice feature. There is, you know, an extra level of depth over the somewhat sophisticated combat. I wouldn't call it sophisticated, but, you know, more sophisticated than other stuff on the market. Not only this, but most of the attacks can also be started in mid-air or just have mid-air variants, which is, you know, another pretty cool feature. In addition to this, each character has a Basara technique, or Basara, I don't actually know how to say the word, so this this is going to be a bit awkward, which is basically the same as Masos in Warriors games, or whatever they're called in Fate Extella. But unlike Masos, it's not the same two animations swinging back and forth. 400 times. Here they actually do a full unique combo, with the exception of, you know, some characters who do just stand there like Nobunaga, and Shingen who summons meteors. And then uh, there are super moves, which, as you can expect, are pretty strong. Each character has three which can be changed on the fly by blocking and pressing the special move button. Most of them are just stronger attacks, uh, but others can be things like buffs for like Yukimura, which will go into a different mode where he's hell of a lot stronger and use every attack with fire, I believe. You can change the way the character plays, like Masamune, who will draw out all six swords and fight like a Wolverine wannabe. And others can be instant kill moves, which require amazing timing, which I can't show you without using low quality recycled footage for my second channel, but that's what you get when you're not very good at this game and play nothing but Astral Chain and strategy games for the last two months. In addition to this, you do get actually get a companion for each stage, which you can switch to on the fly by pressing in an analog stick, which has to be the strangest choice of a button but whatever. So your companion always follows you, they're not like in say Samurai Warriors 4 where you can go and actually order them to do stuff. You can command them on the fly in the most basic form by pressing L2 and they'll move to wherever your marker is. However, if you command them whilst you both have full Basara gauges, uh, you do this super black and white move, uh, which you know usually kills most things in the area, which is you know quite cool, uh, quite a cool aesthetic for that as well. So for a game with 40 characters, there is a phenomenal amount of depth. But that is kind of one of the pitfalls of the game because everyone plays so differently. If you pick a character that is more complicated from the very get-go, it might give you the wrong impression of the game. And even now, there's certain characters that if I picked them as my first, I would probably stop playing. Um, Yoshitsugu Otani and Hisahide Matsunaga I have and will never enjoy playing just because of their playstyle and also don't think they're very interesting so you know. So the final element of the gameplay is totally optional thankfully. Uh, this is the battle roulette where if you defeat certain enemies or take a base then a roulette will happen which can have several outcomes. So obviously a roulette board appears when you defeat them. The red results spawn enemies which drop the Tenka coins which can be used for new costumes, skills and unique weapon inscriptions which we'll get onto a little bit. Black transforms you into either a bomb troop, Mototika's massive ship thingy or Kanetsugu the Invincible Naue uh, which is a joke character in the series which will kill anything in one hit but also ends if you're hit once. Um, although in some situations you can actually be hit twice as him and he'll just walk it off so it's probably a glitch but anyway all can be cancelled by pressing the circle button um, thankfully uh, the bomb troop just 
deploys a massive bomb. Uh, Kanetsugu throws his sword and then like looks for where it is, and that ends it. So yeah, um, thankfully you can end them prematurely because they're quite annoying. And then the gold results instantly give you a thousand Henka coins and any enemy you hit drops them. And finally there is actually the skull icon, which honestly you never want to get, but it will either spawn Musashi Miyamoto, like on screen now, who is monstrously strong. Um, if you defeat him before he despawns, he'll give Tenka coins, which is actually a callback to Sengoku Basra 2, which was a bit of a random stage. You had to defeat him in a certain time limit or uh, the stage was over. So uh, not something I enjoyed, but yeah, here he's, he's quite a good challenge. Uh, another result is bombs will drop from the sky, which any enemies killed in this time will provide coins. Not that you'll be able to, you've got 45 seconds of this bomb onslaught basically. And finally you can be put into a mini game where you're hit on the head out of nowhere. Angels will spawn to drag you to heaven, which you have to shake the analog stick to prevent it. Uh, you also get Tenka coins for successfully doing that, so in any of those situations you can actually get coins for being unfortunate. Thankfully, yeah, this is an optional mechanic, which at the, the point I'm at at the game, I've unlocked everything I've really wanted, so I don't need to do it. Um, so if you do want a bit more comical or a bit more of a challenge, uh, you can play with this option enabled. One of the best features of the game is the upgrade and inscription system. Inscriptions are basically buffs you can add to your weapon. There's a staggering 109 universal inscriptions which anyone can equip and unique style inscriptions which can drastically change how a character is played. Most allow you to use the character's buff skills permanently. Masamune's for example allows him to use all six swords indefinitely which it previously is stopped if you get hit once and Kasuga's allows her to permanently use her rainbow clone thingies and bind enemies with every attack improving both her unique features other than these puppies obviously. While others like Yoshihiro Shimazu's allows you to defeat anyone and anything in one hit and in return you die in one hit too, which is actually easier in this game compared to Sengoku Basura 3 because you have a tag partner in this, if you die you can actually resurrect them by standing in the little circle thingy, whereas in Sengoku Basura 3 that was the end of the stage so yeah, he's a, he's a bit more overpowered here. And then there's more unique ones like Nautora Ease, which makes her deal over double damage to all male characters, but only half to female characters. Um, only Tadagatsu, who's a Gundam, and Kenshin, who in this series plays into the myth that he's a woman, are unaffected by this. So that's a pretty cool and neat little touch. And then there's Maguichi's, which lets her fire homing rockets instead of bullets when using her pistol, which is pretty funny, but it does change the way you play the character. Anyway, the basic inscriptions in grey vary from more attack, elemental damage, parry chance, critical damage, etc. And then the next set are those but upgraded, which you can do by combining that weapon with a weapon with the circular inscription here, which are fairly common. There's some weapons that actually, if you get them as a reward from completing a stage, will have nothing but the change and upgrade um, inscriptions. So that's quite good. Then. The next two rows are combined ones. Not all inscriptions can be combined with each other, but the ones that can are pretty obvious, like elemental damage and elemental chance, critical damage and critical chance. If I talk about all of the more advanced ones, I'll be here all day, but some of them are quite interesting, like passively regen regening health while also getting, you know, plus one hit on every attack. So yeah, there is, a, there will be a link to uh, translation guide provided by Raindrops and Daydreams. Pretty much an essential guide if you want to play this game because it's only in Japanese. Speaking of the elemental damage anyway, the element is actually fixed for each character and it is visible on the weapon at all times. So Kasuga, which I've mentioned many times, always uses light which does bonus critical damage and is easy to break enemies guards. It appears as a sort of weird glow and sparkle. Keiji Maeda does wind damage, draws enemies to you when you attack, and has sort of a strange red wind miasma around the weapon. And then there's fire, ice, and lightning, which you do what they think they do, basically. Um, darkness steals enemies' health. Quake 
causes tremors to appear on the ground and finally the unique Khan makes enemies lethargic and sometimes brainwashes them to attack their allies. Those last two are actually unique to Yoshi, Teru, Ashikaga and Senno Ryukyu. I, I don't actually know how to pronounce his name, he's the schizophrenic basically. The last line of the inscriptions, or the green blocks or whatever, are very hard to obtain but they are also pretty unique and pretty overpowered if, if you want to say that. Um, but they do other unique things like providing more money when you sell a weapon, so basically pointless when you go into a stage. Taking damage provides you with XP points and some other random things. Uh, like the guide I said earlier will provide you with all the information about them. So I briefly mentioned earlier but these inscriptions are added to the weapon by combining them with other weapons. Not only does this provide you with new attributes, but you can also add stats to buff your character like more health, attack, defense easier to fill bus or a gauge and um, whatever the, the rage mode parallel thing is called. So yeah, it is the primary way to increase your attack and defense stats other than ranking up, you know, which is fairly common because each character can be ranked up to 999. So um, now the final feature that sets this game apart from the rest of the crowd are the playbooks, which come in three varieties, white, red and green and could be bought from the in-game store along with you know the weapons and whatever else was there um, XP coins and uh, all that good stuff so the white ones here are augments or handicaps you can put on yourself before a stage they're all considered consumable items um, you can equip three per stage these range from enemies regaining health but you gain two times money at the end of the stage another is getting four times money when you pick it up but is halved whenever you take damage. So those two are an example of the ones marked with an exclamation mark which are you know very high risk reward thingies and then the other ones are basically just buffs like you know three times critical hit chance, enemies are unable to stag you, being able to use all attacks and skills straight away. So if you get that one and you just want to try out a character that's a quite a good way instead of investing shed load of XP points. The other playbooks, uh, the red ones allow you to change the music in the stage to a character's theme which for the last stage in each story you kind of have to do because of the obnoxious theme song which for some reason has to play instead of the stage music. I suppose they want their money's worth out of the band that performed it because it has to play in their opening, main menu and story character select which makes sure that the song is fully drilled into your brain and then you want to kill yourself. Um, it's not even that good of a song either, it's just annoying. It's hardly, you know, the Doom soundtrack or Rice is a Side Dish by After School Tea Time. And then lastly, there are the green books, which change what characters say in the stage. One of them changes so allied soldiers will constantly praise you. Another will have Kanatsugu boast about how great he is every so often. And before I forget and because we're drawing to the end of the video I want to mention this game does actually have microtransactions as well to buy XP points, super powered weapons but it's all linked to the PSN account that buys them so it's Japanese accounts only. It's something that's not really needed either because XP, gold and points to upgrade weapons come in such a massive amount that even someone that's bad at this game like myself will have enough to get through it. There are some other small details but there's so much in this game that if I talked about everything I'd be here all day and it's not like anyone's going to get to this part of the video or watch it in general. So hopefully I've mentioned everything and anything I've forgotten I will add in at the last second and it will sound really off, adding to the already poor effort of this review. All joking aside, this is one of the best hack and slash games on the market. It's a shame Capcom didn't localise it, it would certainly raise the bar for other series to reach like Dynasty Warriors, the Fate, Extella games that Marvelous produced. Honestly if this was localised they'd have Koei by the balls, assuming they have any. But anyway, so this is probably one of my favourite games although the randomised nature of the story means you can, when you change from character to character, it can get a bit stale rather quickly. So that is one sort of downside, uh, if you could call it. It's a lot of fun and it's certainly one of the better games on the market. 
I hope people enjoy this video considering I knocked this one up quicker than someone from Alabama does to his sister. So thank you for watching and don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, set your head on fire and uh, eat some batteries and I'll see you next time.